It is January the 4th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. And what a year, what a year, what a year, what a year. Uh, crazy, it's a new one. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Is it going to be the same kind of, let, let me adjust my volume here. Is it? Is it uh, the same? Is it going to be the same as before? Is it going to change? What do you think? What's your, what's your prediction? It's going to change. I mean, that's the only thing that we can rely on. It. <laughs> There's going to be change. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, um, we have uh, an episode for you that we originally uh, wanted to do on uh, the 29th, but it just didn't work out because of, well, busyness on my side. I'm, I'll take it all on me. I'm the culprit. So um, the official year <laughs> end episode is turning into a year beginning episode, but still, I think we want to have a quick look back at the things that have happened. Um, and uh, let's kick this off with an with a feedback that we received by Robert uh, Spagiari. Spagiari, I hope I don't mispronounce that too badly. Um, which was on the uh, episode one fourteen, which was about the A sixty eight iceberg breaking. No, not breaking up, but becoming a danger for wildlife. Threatening, yeah, threatening to to be grounded on South Georgia. Yeah. yeah. So um, let me just read what he says and then we can comment on it. Wildlife enthusiasts were rightly concerned the mega iceberg did indeed hit the continental shelf south of South Georgia. Fortunately, it did not become grounded. Instead, it did a kind of bounce eastwards in the current away from the zone of greatest danger and pieces have been breaking off of it. Uh, BBC News website has been monitoring it and I hope I have understood the mechanics well enough. Though the news is good, this episode touches upon wider issues for wildlife beyond the, uh, the vagaries of traveling mega icebergs. It is illuminating to ask of wildlife, what, why are you here rather than somewhere else? Uh, Goethe preferred to go somewhere warmer. Polar environments may seem a bit crazy to those who inhabit temp temperate climates. Uh, it remains true, however, that predictability in the environment is a matter of life and death. An animal has to go where a quality food source will be at a particular time of year with a particular temperature as it has to balance its energy budget, something human visitors can also feel. Wildlife has no grocery stores and has to expend a certain amount of energy to hopefully successfully capture its food. Big and rapid changes in the environment are not good for life. This was the danger of disruption posed by the mega iceberg remaining in an, in an abnormal place for it and altering multiple factors in the local environment. That are that the animals are where they are demonstrates one of the most valuable aspects of the polar regions. They indicate the productivity of the marine environment. For them, this is a beautiful home that they would not wish to lose or change. I had been just listening to Curiously Polar as a podcast, but Henry here has given me an education in the use of visual tools. I hope Curiously Polar will continue to come out on video and develop the visual aspect. Well, that, that's a very Thank nice Thank you feedback. very much. That was a, it was a, indeed a very nice feedback. And I have to, um, extend it because it's not me um, using the visual tools without uh, you, Chris, um, that wouldn't be possible. So I just provide the sources and just do some research. And uh, you are the tech wizard behind that too. You know, 20, 2020 with the pandemic and everything has been an amazing kick in the butt for learning new Indeed, skills, yeah. for learning new technologies, for learning how to for rethinking our own business models yes absolutely so th this is um yeah this has been a wild ride for everyone and um what we're doing is making the best out of it and and hopefully going a step beyond and this is only small small beginnings but um i'm really happy how this is coming together of course with with a good good co-host who's uh, playing along upgrading some of the cameras and stuff i mean we have really both on both sides changed things uh back to and it's the quite some some fun the the enhancement um as i see it it really boosts 
um, the podcast, the content of the podcast onto a different level if you have a chance to visualize that. Yes. And um, especially when you have some some far away remote areas, it's sometimes very difficult to um, visualize that, to imagine that. And having some nice pictures and nice videos from different sources helps a lot. And yes. um, I'm really glad that we made that move and um, yeah, have also a visual version of that podcast. Right. And uh, back to um, Robert's comments. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the one thing that I most distinctly remember when talking with a polar guide about photographing wildlife, I'm a pho I come from photography, so I'm interested in getting the most amazing uh, polar bear in front of my lens, that kind of stuff. But um, the one thing I learned, and that's many years ago, um, was that these animals don't have a lot of reserves. They don't have, they cannot expend uh, more, often they cannot expend more energy than they have to get their food. And if you as a human get in the way, if you disturb them in their environment, it might mean that a polar bear or whatever other animal has to go out of its way and will not get the food that it would have gotten if you weren't there. And that might mean that might be a decision over life and death for it. Yes, exactly. So th that is th that's that's the reason one of the reasons why the A68 iceberg is so concerning because it, it's not just there and then the animals go somewhere else. No, they might just have to. Uh, ha they just might not have enough food and might have to die because of the iceberg going there. As blunt as that. So indeed. Thanks, Robert. For... Uh, we're not we're not we're not through that yet. So we, we've we've seen now uh, we're still following the iceberg. Yes. Uh, it ha has passed uh, South Georgia. So the biggest threat has passed in a way that the entire uh, size of the iceberg won't be grounded because what happened is that the iceberg actually started breaking apart. And when we talk about breaking apart, we think about a lot of small things. But even the smaller icebergs are large enough for the um, for the authorities to give them name, to just yes. appoint uh, names to them. And the smallest piece that broke off on the 17th of uh, December um, still has 150 square kilometers. And that's not too small. Yeah, we, we're going to look at uh, some pictures of that in a minute. Um, before that, um, the Sevmorput, the Russian... A uh, supply ship that lost parts of its propeller um, apparently is back in St. Petersburg. And for those who are interested, what it looks like, there is a video up on Vimeo that, um, let me just bring that up here, that gives us a bit of an aerial look at the ship. So you, you, you can get an additional idea of what it looks like. So this is for all the listeners who listen to the audio version. That is where you are missing out on a few very uh, nice images they've done an amazing job filming that and there's a that's a shift being loaded with something i'm not sure if it's for this actual mission but um, no no that's uh, a few years back um in the in the arctic it was actually um loading uh construction materials for the pipeline but also uh supply stuff and we see basically uh, seven more port, the, the container nuclear container vessel moored to a harbor surrounded by a lot of brush and sea ice and then you see pilot boats just um or talks just um yeah bringing it out away from um from the pier and bringing it in motion and that's basically um the, the big thing on that video is to see that ship in action and see what it's capable of and what it can do and why it was chosen <laughs> presumably to... with a fully functional propeller <laughs> indeed <laughs> Why well, it was chosen to to um, yeah bring all the supplies for the new Vostok station to Antarctica. Unfortunately, that didn't happen now. So um, I'm I'm really curious about the incident report later on. Uh, I hope that will be something published later this year or maybe next year. We don't know. Interesting. If there's interesting, anything published. Uh, interesting change in this show, by the way, over the last uh, months was that <laughs> it has more and more turned into a news show because Indeed, there yeah. are actual news coming in from Antarctica and from things that surround and it. And updates. So, and really updates on those news. News updates. So, you know, I've, 
I've, as I said, I'm a photographer and I'm really also into film photography. And that's an interesting thing because also unexpectedly film photography has generated so much news that you could actually, or there are now actually uh, film photography news shows giving you updates on what new films are coming out and cameras and stuff. It's um, so, yeah, but uh, we are still obviously going to, concentrate on like actual topics next episode will be an interesting one uh, from that regard oh, sure, yeah. so it, we're not deteriorating into just being a news show that's a promise <laughs> um yeah so but we also won't limit ourselves to pick up some news every now and then if something uh, related to the polar region uh, really um hits our uh, focus right so uh, yeah I, I think the news is, is an interesting part because it the ongoingness of news sometimes i mean i like to know what's going on with that ship and if there's any additional information on if, if they managed to put a new piece of the propeller on and so on it would be um, just really curious to figure out what really happened and how it's possible a propeller blade just got lost in the middle of the ocean so for me, this is less news, but more like really curious, uh, a curious case. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 2020 has been fully, fully overshadowed <laughs> by a big bad virus going around the world. So um, we've we've seen like. I mean, the, the, the news are 100% dominated by COVID-19, by SARS-CoV-2, by the pandemic. And um, one of the things that we held up here was that Antarctica is COVID-free, which wasn't too hard because during that time frame, the scientists were there. There wasn't too much exchange with the outside world. Um, but now that has changed. The Antarctic report has on Twitter, uh, has uh, written, sadly, Antarctica is no longer free of COVID-19. The Chilean army today reported 36 personnel at O'Higgins base have tested positive, which um, was 26 military and 10 civilians. The station has been undergoing the annual exchange of personnel over the last few weeks. So that's the Chilean, Chilean base. Uh, that's a report from December the 22nd. So I uh, haven't seen a lot of updates uh, from that, but it is something that, yeah, is, uh, uh, is a concern, right? It certainly is, uh, especially when we have the, the turnover, the, uh, the annual turnover of um, scientists um, that's stuffing the, the uh, research stations for uh, a new season, for a new year, new winter. And there needs to be a turnover if you always keep in mind the sheer remoteness of those stations and how much you're um, yeah, encapsulated in there. The Chilean station here is something special, something different, because it inherits also um, families. So you have actually uh, civilian personnel there, but also families living. It's one of the uh, interesting parts of um, the history of uh, Chile and, and Argentina. Uh, when it comes to Antarctica, that they both try to support their uh, regional claims on Antarctica with civilians living there for actually really um, establishing colonies there and also giving birth to children in Antarctica to have actually real Antarcticans. And that's a, the, the major difference. But for most of the uh, research stations, you are far, far away from everything. It's not that you can just go out um, of the station if you just have a headache and you really just want to go for a walk. It's not as simply as that. And you really are just trapped in and uh, you can't choose the people you're with and mm. so on. So this turnover is very, very important. So the scientific programs have put a lot of effort in there to make sure that they don't carry the virus um, to Antarctica. Unfortunately, all those measures haven't been enough and as we've seen, um, having 36 positively um, tested personnel in that station, that's a, a big number. Um, the, the 
The question is, of course, um, th there is not much travel between the different stations in Antarctica, no, I would yeah. expect. So I think the, there's a good, well, the hope is that this will not spread because it can't really spread because they're not visiting each other all the time, such as a lot of people have done over Thanksgiving and Christmas um, here. Um, yeah, so I, I at least have the hope that this is a very isolated case and it will stay isolated. The only question mark that uh, remains is if it happens in one uh, Chilean station, um, have those measures in place been not strong enough so it can also affect other Chilean stations? And then we have on King George Island, for example, uh, a huge uh, density of research stations. And there we might have some um, exchange of personnel or just contact um, among the stations. That's kind of a traditional thing there. I'm not sure how how open they are um, regarding uh, COVID, how, how, how much the exchange still um, exists, but that's something that uh, always has to be kept in mind. So it still is the big question, how has the measurements uh, affected actually also the uh, turnover on other stations? And that's just something time will tell. Okay, uh, another topic that we talked about in, let me check, episode 102 uh, was the greatest ecological disaster since the Exxon Valdez. Um, you remember the oil spill that we talked about, another news kind of topic, because uh, it Which happened. was actually almost non-existent in media, at yeah. least in Central Europe. Yeah, I haven't seen it anywhere other than here on this show and in a few more obscure pr publications. So yeah, um, it's really difficult to get to get um, news updates on that um, if you're not um, speaking Russian. Yeah, if you're, if you're not able to read Russian news, it's, it's quite difficult. So um, there's an article that has come out on the 28th of December, just a few days ago, uh, by the Moscow Times. And it is titled, Russia admits to world's largest Arctic oil spill. So there is now uh, at least something official. Uh, it says Russian authorities said the, full, the fuel spill at an Arctic power station earlier in 2020 was the largest in world history, a top emergencies official said. On Thursday, some 21,000 tons of oil poured into the surrounding ground and waterways near the city of Norilsk after a diesel oil tank belonging to a subsidiary of Russian metal giant Nornickel collapsed on May 29th. Um, so yeah, they go into more detail about this um, and uh, go into, into some studies. I have no other word than what's in the article in some studies that says the microflora in the studied waters has adapted to oil product products and is able to participate in their decomposition. So one of the members... Uh, of the members of the so-called Great Norilsk Expedition organized by the Siberian branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences in August. So um, that is at least some scientific backing to that that says uh, nature will take care of it or at least partially will take care of it. That's what they say. Um, yeah, what's really surprising is that um, this has been um, tackled by top officials of the Russian government. And there's a statement right. of Putin where he clearly um, states that Nornickel, and especially the CEO of Nornickel, has to take over responsibility here um, as the um, source of that accident. And Nornickel actually really fights hardly um, the claim of the Russian government. Uh, the Russian government claims two billion uh, US dollars in um, yeah for the cleanup amount and that so was on? exactly for for the cleanup um, and the damage done in the area. And that shows uh, a little bit the significance of that incident. Um, how much it actually can affect uh, Russians' strategy of um, implementing the Northern Sea Route as one of the major sea routes uh, in the oceans and really facilitating the, the Arctic Ocean as a, a transportation hub. Okay. Well, well, well. Another news story to keep an eye on. <laughs> 
Um, okay, let's get back to our favorite iceberg of all of them. Um, A68. <laughs> uh, as you said earlier, it is beginning to break up. Um, and there's a couple of uh, reports here. Let me open that one in a separate window. Can I do this? Yes, I can. Yeah, it was just a question of time. Um, as we talked about the iceberg in the past episodes, um, you might remember that it's an incredibly thin iceberg given its uh, sheer size, originating from an iceberg um, spanning 5,700 square kilometers. It was just 200 meters and a bit thick, or it still is. So it is incredibly thin. And I remember we used the example in the last episodes of an A4 sheet of paper and four or five of them stapled together. That would be kind of the scale of the iceberg and its thinness. It's really incredible. And if you also um, consider the origin, an ice shelf, um, which already has kind of breakup lines in the ice uh, due to um, the morphology of the of the ice, uh, so the the bad rock topography, um, the ice moves over. Um, we have some predefined breakup lines in the iceberg, and it was really interesting to see how long, for how many years, this iceberg kept its uh, size, uh, considering the ocean currents, the strong waves, or the weather that comes up. And then the Antarctic report has published on December 22, um, a nice satellite picture that just shows that the so-called finger, um, the long um, prolongation of the iceberg has just formed deep cuts and uh, the ocean currents actually have just broken it, uh, yeah, broken it off from the um, basic, uh, from, from the main iceberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... Antarctic report on the 23rd, the day after that, reported um, new names. So as, you, as, <laughs> as, as we said and you said here, the, the, they just get letters added to. So now at that point or back in, in on December 23rd, they were, uh, they were going from E to F. So A68F was the official latest one that had happened or had emerged on the 23rd. And um, possibly... And on the picture... We can also clearly see the iceberg has turned, so the finger is pointing towards the south. And with that, the iceberg is in the middle of the um, circumpolar current of Antarctica. So the current is coming from the from the site, and it's just too strong. So the, the, the prolongation is just very fragile. So the finger just broke off due to the pressure of the current. Really amazing example of uh, the force of that ocean. And what happened after that is that uh, the currents have just picked up. The smaller pieces are traveling faster because they have less uh, weight, less tonnage to, to uh, carry on. And indeed, the current have, has just um, turned the uh, movement around. So the finger is turning back towards the south uh, east of uh, South Georgia, the um, remaining piece of um, the main iceberg, A68A, is following, but much, much slower. So that's just a, a interesting follow-up in the next couple of episodes to see if one of those chunks of those pieces gets somewhere close to the coastline to actually get grounded there. And when we talk in, when we're talking about the threat of grounding um, of of, a, of the iceberg of that size. The threat is just not much smaller of the smaller breakup pieces because they're still incredibly large. We're talking yes. still about the smallest piece on that picture in the in the in the top of that picture, A sixty eight D has hundred and fifty square kilometers. We always have to keep that in mind. So if that grounds there, it still has a large impact, not on the entire island, but on certain areas of the island and there. Uh, ecosystems there so that's yes. just always something keep in mind when we talk uh, about breaking up of an iceberg of that size it's not ice cubes it still is huge tabular icebergs and uh, another piece of information from this um, chart uh, from from this text is the minimum size for name designation and tracking is 20 square nautical miles which is 68 
square kilometers. So that's that that that's got to give you an idea of that. Uh, those still are quite big pieces. So that's the news. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so we we said that we wanted to have a bit of a look back over 2020 and what we've done here on the show and the things that kind of stand out to us. And the first thing that stands out to us is that we've done 37 episodes in 2020, um, which, given that 2020 was a pretty uh, suboptimal year, um, I think we've done <laughs> fairly well. Yes, and I think we also have done uh, quite a, a wide range of topics and. Within those topics, we had like two very important polar anniversaries, one in the north and one in the south. That's quite nice as a um, equality fact here. And the first uh, anniversary we covered in episode 104 is the 100 year anniversary of the Svalbard Treaty, which originally was called the Spitsbergen Treaty. It's so 100 years um, already under its deck. The second anniversary, not less important, is the 200 years of the discovery of Antarctica. And that's a very big discussion still. Who is actually the explorer, the, 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 the explorer that first uh, got sight on Antarctica? And official sources tell today it is Fabian von Bellingshausen who discovered Antarctica on January 27, 1820. So last January, a year ago, it was 200 years from then. Big debate was, has he actually spotted land or just an iceberg? From the description of his journal, it's uh, thought that he might have spotted um, a big part of the shelf ice of Queen Maudland. Just three days later, it was uh, the British Naval officer at Bransfield who uh, got also um, sight on an article. For quite some time, he was believed to be the first one who has um, yeah, spotted Antarctica. And then also, just a year later, the Americans didn't really went far behind. Uh, John Davis, a sealer and explorer, he was the first one who actually sat step um, or set foot on Antarctica in 1821. So this is 200 years in this year, big anniversary. So the other big topics, of course, again, the iceberg, COVID, um, but then we've also covered a lot of geopolitical things, a lot of geographical things, a lot around ice and volcanism. So th there's, a, there's a whole bunch of, uh, a whole breadth of um, areas that we have covered. And uh, I think one of the bigger things that um, you and I both are proud of, proud of is our cultural coverage of the um of the arctic in this case and that is our voices of the north series or i'd have to say it's your voices of the north <laughs> series because the the amount of work that you put into that is really astounding um we had a starting with episode 98 then 99 100 101 and 103 uh that is a five episode series of music in the north that's one of the major features of the Arctic compared to Antarctica is that you have culture, you have people living there, you have history, you have really indigenous people who um, inherit a history. And still considering the, the um, remoteness of their settlements, it's so interesting to see how certain cultural aspects develop. And music plays a huge part in my life. I am barely in a remote area compared to uh, those um, settlements. So for me, that was really um, yeah, just a topic dear to my heart to figure out how is their music um, history, but also music traditions, how have they evolved over the years, um, over the centuries. And it's interesting also to see throughout the series, where are the similarities between um, different indigenous groups and um, geographical areas? And where are the differences? And for me, that was really fun. It was uh, sometimes really a pain to um, get a hold of people and get some copyright clearances. That's something we just have to always consider. But that certainly is a series to be continued. I'm pretty sure about that. 
yeah that was uh, it, it it really for me it really changed the pace sometimes because you have these bam 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 things and then you have something that really depends on a very quiet slow kind of music playing for five minutes and um i'm pretty sure we tested the patience of some of our listeners but um i, to I totally enjoyed those sitting here with uh wide open ears and enjoying that so um, yeah, if you've got some that, amazing, we have the links. Yeah, we got some amazing feedback over the entire year, but the vast majority of the feedback came from for that series. So that's also something uh, you out there enjoyed quite a lot. So thank you very much for for tuning in there, and um, we definitely will continue that. And and I think this is kind of the place where. Uh, we have to say thank you to everyone who listens to this, to the entire audience, because, I mean, face it, without you out there, this would not be happening. We wouldn't do it if, if no one was watching it or listening to it. And um, mm -hmm. every little bit of feedback from you is so welcome because it always makes it more real. You know, the, it, it, it's like, oh, there is actually someone listening and someone's actually putting... Um, putting some value in what we say or getting some value of what we say, what we do and what we do research. And this is also the point or also, where... Or also corrections, right? When you when you just got oh, someone sure. who, who who just figures, oh, there, there has been a, a flaw in the, in the data. Just feel free. That's what we are for. Yeah. And uh, and this is also the point where I'd say thank you, Henry, because the, you, you are the, the, the principal researcher on this show. Uh, you bring the majority of topics. We'll change that with the next episode. I've done research on the next topic, but uh, that is only a, a small fraction of the work that you have put into this, um, which, yeah, again, is it's just amazing to be able to work with someone who's such a prolific uh, source of information who knows where to look and to find things and to put them in perspective so um thank you well, i can Henry. give give that back a hundred percent because i think a team effort only um is visible um on here in particular on on the on the visual part of the podcast but that's just Example, uh, example, yeah, the example for um, what we are, what we are doing. So I'm working on the, on a content side, but you do the entire technical um, backend there. So thank you very much that um, the recording is always uh, flawless. That you came up with a video idea that the entire backend there just works without my input at all. I just click a button to come online. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's how, um, yeah, nice, advanced um, and enhanced uh, Chris just developed the, the entire system here. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that uh, the two of us found each other and we just, yeah, I'm, I don't want to put any limit on, on, on that show. It's um, pretty amazing. It keeps me going. It keeps me digging um, in, in fields I'm not as comfortable in when I just uh, on my regular job, but I really, really like um just keeping up my curiosity about everything um, polar. Yes. Okay, enough thank yous thrown around. Um, I think we can bring this one to an end. Um, I think we'll pick up the the uh, picks of the week next week. Um, for now, that is the episode. Let me let me play our beautiful outro here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, th advances, technical advances. So yeah, we are of course online at curiouslypolar.com. You can find us on our social media. Curiously Polar is our handle on the Insta, on the Twitters. And um, yeah, drop by, say hi. We are uh, planning for an exciting 2021. Until then, everyone take care and bye-bye. Goodbye.